another episode of Christian with Baptist Podcast. I'm your host and servant in Jesus Christ, Paladin Actual. Today we're going to be doing another scatterbrain Bible study, this time on 1 Timothy chapter 6. Though as the rules for scatterbrain Bible study state, I tend to wander down a few different rabbit trails. So in this episode in particular, I begin the episode on 1 Timothy chapter 6 with investigating some text in Deuteronomy 18 and then later Hebrews 1. So in the beginning, I start talking about prophets, how we can find out who is a false prophet, who is a real prophet, and kind of the consequences for these things. Then I go to Hebrews chapter 1 and I ask the question, are there any true prophets today? Now, again, you'll notice for Bible study in 1 Timothy chapter 6, we've yet to actually get into it until like a quarter of the way in. Eventually, I do actually get into 1 Timothy chapter 6, at which point I start talking about slavery and how masters and slaves should behave according to the Bible. Different things in the Bible all referred to as slaves and, you know, how to tell them apart and what things are similar as well. Then I talk about the love of money and the root of all evil, or rather the way the Bible verse actually states at first that people tend to misquote on purpose for whatever reason. Uh, finally, I talk about stewardship and how this doesn't just mean money, but also being a good steward of the Word of God and sacraments. For all of these topics and more, I hope you enjoy this scatterbrain Bible study on 1 Timothy chapter 6 and whatever else kind of pops into my mind along the way. God bless you. Enjoy. So the question I heard was about prophets. Now, there's an excellent place to look. I mean, there's lots of places in the Bible that talk about prophets. One of the most important sections in the Bible to look about prophets is in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. It's in the beginning, so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 18, if you would, wouldn't mind turning your, your Bibles to there. Deuteronomy 18, and specifically, we're going to look at verse 15 and following. So there's all kinds of laws. If you're wondering what the book of Deuteronomy is about, the name Deuteronomy, Deuto, means second, uh, namas. Deuteronomy, namas, is law, second law, so the second giving of the law. So in Exodus, you've got, um, or Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, you've got the giving of the law, and then Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law. So a lot of the laws are found in Deuteronomy, and a lot of them repeat from other, from other parts in the Bible. All right, so Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 and following, <coughs> says this, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers, it is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let, let me not hear again the voice of my Lord, the Lord my God, or see great fire anymore, lest I die. Okay, pausing real quick. This is talking about when Moses was up on the mountain, the Israelites had just come out of Egypt, the Exodus, and they were scared of God because he's fire and thunder, right? So they said, let me not talk to God directly, but... Give me somebody who can talk to God on my behalf and that will tell me what God says because I will die if I'm in the presence of God. Some wisdom there. Um, verse 17, and the Lord said to me, and every time you see the word Lord, it's probably all capital in your Bible. That's talking about Yahweh. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from, from among their brothers and I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I have commanded him or all that I command him. That's the definition of a prophet. That's what a prophet is. It's somebody who God puts words in his mouth and he speaks what God commands. A prophet is someone, in the, in the Hawaiian pidgin translation of the Bible, they don't use the word prophet. They say, the people that talk for God. The one that talks for God is a prophet. Or the one that speaks God's word is a prophet. So, to some degree, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a lowercase p prophet in that I read the Bible. Not that God has given me special revelation, but when I read the Bible out loud, I am telling you what God says. Thus saith the Lord is the phrase of the prophet. Um, uh, let, me see verse, let me see verse 18, verse 19. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will, will require of him. Pay attention here. Verse 20, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how will we know that the word of the, pro the Lord has, excuse me, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. 
So if we want to understand what prophets are, a prophet is somebody who speaks for God. Uh, in, in the most casual sense, when you read the Bible, you are prophesying. The Bible talks about prophesying. Prophesy to somebody. And a lot of times, that just means you're speaking God's word from the Bible, right? In specific instances, God gives people words to say. Say this to my people. My people should hear this. He talks to Elijah and Isaiah and all these other prophets. And he says, tell this to my people. He tells it to Moses. Moses was a prophet. Give these laws to my people. Moses was prophesying. But in many cases in the Bible, prophecy, when it's talking about the gift of prophecy and stuff like that, it's not talking necessarily about special revelation. It's confusing. It's one of these words that's used for different things. The problem is nowadays we have these people who go and they say, well, I'm a prophet. I'm a prophet. Therefore, you must listen to me. And the Lord has said to me, as I was making toast this morning, he laid it on my heart, is a phrase that is often used. He has laid this on my heart. He has revealed this to me in a dream or just a general sort of the Lord said to me and not really how. Uh, and then they just kind of rattle off some stuff that, they, that they, they made up most of the time. There's a group called the New Apostolic Reformation. A bunch of heretics, all of them. Um, and they <laughs> unfortunately write a lot of the praise music that a lot of people like to sing from Hillsong and Bethel. Uh, which is one of the reasons I'm opposed to a lot of the praise music is because it's written by people who claim to be prophets from God and say things that God has not said. Um, and they will say things like, God has revealed to me that the word for this month is prosperity. Prosperity is the word for this month. Then you get to plug and play that into everything in your life and you get to find some way to make it so they're right about prosperity or change. Change is the word for this month. Upheaval. There will be a suddenly. Not suddenly something will happen. A suddenly. There will be a suddenly will happen in your life. Many suddenlies will happen in your life. It's one of their favorite phrases. There's a whole list of, of words that they use. They do a, we played bingo with them one time. How do we know? How do we know? Who the true prophets are and who aren't the true prophets. In Deuteronomy 18, it asks that exact question that you asked, which is an excellent question. Um, verse 21, and you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? Remember the previous verse says, if, if, a, if a prophet or someone claiming to be a prophet says, thus saith the Lord, when the Lord did not thus saith, if they're lying about a prophecy, they are to be put to death. So it's kind of severe if you're pretending to be a prophet and you're not. It's called taking the name of the Lord your God in vain. It's, it's up there in the commandments. So verse 21 says, you say, and you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? Verse 22 answers that. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word the Lord has not spoken. So if you are a prophet, and you have anything less than a 100% success rate in your prophecies, you are a false prophet. What about those clowns that say he said this, but it hasn't happened yet? It will happen in... I mean, could they be a prophet? Maybe. Is there any way? To, I mean, you should usually look for like some sort of indication that they are firsthand, that they can confirm it. Yes. No, we, we, so we're not in Timothy right now. We're in Deuteronomy right now. We're talking about prophets. We'll get to, we, we'll get to Timothy if we have time, but. Deuteronomy 18. Yes. Deuteronomy 18 verses 15 through 22 is what we're just reading. Just reading about prophets. So this is the problem. With a lot of these people, the prophecies of the future, the world will end in 2026, whatever. Have you ever heard of any of these guys who have predicted like what? Mm-hmm. Now oh, well, okay. If they got the date wrong, they're still wrong, though. <laughs> if they're saying, we're going to go to, you know, the Lord has laid it on my heart that we're going to go to war with China in the year 2021, and it's 2024, and we haven't gone, and we go to war with China in 2024, they are a false prophet. Because God does not get the dates wrong. He says, in three days, I will raise him. And in three days, Jesus was raised from the tomb. He, God understands dates. He doesn't make oopsies. And when he's communicating to his prophets, it, there's never an example in scripture that where, where the prophet says, ah, I think the Holy Spirit maybe vaguely said that there was a thing that was going to happen around this year to this, this year, maybe. No, God says, you know, 
uh, the temple will be destroyed or you will, you know, smash your children against the rocks and eat your babies because you'll be so hungry. Like these specific things that specifically happen. When you're laughing, <laughs> you're familiar with this prophecy. Uh, that happened. That was in the diaspora, I think, or the Babylonian captivity. Do I know of any false prophets now? Any tr- Being a true prophet right now, I am glad you asked. Turn to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. We can, we can, and that is an excellent question. It's like you're just, you're just teeing them up for me perfectly. Hebrews chapter one, this is in the New Testament. Uh, it's written for the people who are familiar with the Old Testament, the Hebrews, one might call them. Um, so this is, ooh, where is it? It's near the end, it's before Revelation, also known as the Apocalypse of St. John. If you want to be snobby about what you call Revelation, which I, I do like. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 1. All right. Hebrews chapter 1, specifically the first two verses, will answer this question. Are there any current day prophets? Current day prophets. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our father, fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. Through him, he also created the world. It goes on to talk about Jesus. So this is Hebrews chapter one, verses one through two. This is not necessarily saying that God never reveals something to somebody in a dream. This is not necessarily saying that God doesn't give you maybe a notion of something. Like, um, do you know who Jan Hus is? Has anybody heard of Jan Hus? Jan, spelled Jan, Jan Hus. So before Martin Luther, there's this guy called Jan Hus, Jan Hus. And I I don't want to call him a a Protestant, but kind of. He was one of the guys that came around and was saying, well, the Roman Catholic Church is wrong about these things. And he laid them out, so they killed him. (laughs) And they were going to do the same thing to Luther, but Luther, just the coincidence has happened, and and Luther survived. Luther was accused of being a follower of Jan Hus, a Hussite. Uh, And at the beginning, he says, I reject that heretic. He's a heretic, I know, because he was burned at the stake, and only heretics are burned at the stake. Later on in his life, Luther said, you know what? He was right. He was right about what he was saying. I am a Hussite. Um, When Jan Hus was put to death, a hundred years before Luther, Jan Hus was put to death. They they burned him at the stake. And he makes a joke. Uh, The word Hus is, I forget what language it is. It's not German. It's, um, uh, It's one of those countries around there. Um, the word hus means goose. His last words when he's dying, when he's being burned to death, are, my goose is cooked. <laughs> but before that, before that, when they're putting him to death, he says, today you will burn this goose, but in a hundred years a swan will arise that no one can put down. And a hundred years after the death of Jan Hus, Martin Luther came on the scene. So, so that means that Jan Hus was, was put to death, I think, what would that be, 1417? If 1517 is when Martin Luther started nailing the 95 Theses and stuff. So there is some degree, and there are some examples where people can, you know, um, where I'm sure you could find people in this congregation who maybe they had a dream that, you know, a relative living far away was sick or died or something, then they find out you know, a couple days later that that relative actually had died. Something like that, where God does reveal information to people um, that we wouldn't normally know. So we know that that exists. But in the sense of a prophet, remember, a prophet is somebody who speaks for God, where God says, give, give these words to my people. That office, that role, that job does not exist anymore. There is no such thing as a modern day prophet. In the sense that I read from the scripture, sure. In the sense that I, I commune with God on the mountain. Remember what Moses did. He went up to the mountain to talk to God, and God says, say this to my people. And, the, and Elijah would talk to God, and God said, say this to my people. In that sense, that... Well, yes and no. In the sense that God has given me something new to give to you, no. God has not given me something new to give to all y'all. He has given me the scripture He's given you the same scripture and he says, give this to my people. And he gives you, so well, let's say if I'm, if I'm struggling with something and you got a Bible verse and you says, you know, you, you says, you says, and then you says to me, Hey, you says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you'll fear no evil. And this comforts me. Well, you are spe- you are doing God's work. God is working through you to give me a message from God. 
The message from God is in the Bible, conveniently. Lots of messages for you from God are in the Bible. I, kind of, I don't like the, the wishy-washy language of the Bible is God's love letter to you. It's kind of, kind of uh, I don't like how it feels saying that. But to a degree, I get it. The Bible is written for you, for your benefit. It is written, and if somebody gives you something from God, you know, so here, this is a word from God, you know, read a psalm to you. Uh, and this happens a lot of times when I'm, when I'm doing the, the readings, you know, the, the reading is, is from God to you. This is a, a message uh, to you from God. Uh, another example is an absolution when God tells me to forgive you. He says this in John chapter 20, to forgive, uh, the, forgive the sins of others. And I say, as I called and ordained servant of the Lord, and in the said and by the command of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. That is God working through me to forgive you. This is me giving you God's forgiveness. Pardon? Not in the, yeah, that's correct. Not in the same way that Moses was a prophet. I don't have a mountain to, I don't go up to Mount Lemon and commune with God. And, and um, Moses in particular was distinct. There is a phrase that's used for Moses uh, that we translate to, and he talked to God face to face. The Hebrew is he talked to God lips to lips, which is like as close as you can get to a person. So this is how close God talked with Moses. God spoke with Moses. Um, I don't do that. Would be kind of neat if it happened. Would be really terrifying if it happened. But nobody on this earth is getting messages from God to disseminate to the entire world. You know, the Lord has laid on my heart that Donald Trump has come. To <laughs> prophet, a shepherd, under shepherd. Yeah, so in the sense of the job of prophet, in the sense of Hebrews chapter, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Long ago, at many times, and you, you'll hear this sometimes in the service. I forget, it's divine service setting... Two, maybe? I don't remember. There's one of them uh, where I say this after I read the text. Uh, or maybe it's, maybe it's like one of the evening services or something. Uh, and many times God spoke to his father by the prophets. God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he's spoken to us by his son whom he appointed. So Jesus is the fulfillment. So everybody who was talking for God before Jesus was, was transmitting, God said to me, this thing to you. When Jesus shows up, Jesus is the perfect prophet because he can talk for God because he is God. He's, he's the intermediary between us and the Father, and he can talk for God perfectly because he's in perfect fellowship with God. So Jesus is the perfect, perfect prophet, and then perfect priest, perfect king, all those good things. So excellent question regarding, regarding prophets. Um, yeah, Deuteronomy 18 is a good verse that we can look at to be skeptical, and then Hebrews 1 tells us about our present-day situation with prophets. Now, because we're not living in the time of the Israelites, when you turn on YouTube or TBN or whatever, and you see a prophet on there, and they're saying, you know, God laid it on my heart that you need to give a seed offering of $10,000. We're not supposed to put them to death. But if they were Israelites back in the time when God had given this, they would have been put to death. That's the kind of thing that gets one put to death in Israelite society. So even though the death penalty is not currently active for false prophets, for people who blaspheme and says, Thus saith the Lord, when the Lord did not thus saith. The principle still remains that that was something serious enough that would get you killed. So it's not something that should be flippantly done. And again, if you turn on YouTube, you know, God will hold these people accountable that do not repent. I wouldn't listen to them. I wouldn't listen to them except for derision and mocking. For the sake of that, and as a general principle, anything that they say is, 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 is trash. Even if they get one out of 100 prophecies right, no, no. Um, the only time that, the only time in the Bible when people listened to false prophets and it was maybe considered a good thing was like Elijah was listening to the false prophets of Baal make a fool of themselves. So for the sake of like, oh yes, they are foolish people and they are speaking foolishness. And I hear this with my own ears. That would be the only sense that I would even listen to them in passing, but do not seek them out and more likely you know, make distance from them because they are, they're spiritual poison. They are saying, they're breaking the first commandment. If you're around people who blaspheme all the time, that will affect you spiritually. Even if you don't agree with them, it's just, it's just draining. Anyways, I know a couple of these people. Get, well, they give you false hope or worse. They get you to doubt the words of God because you're used to get so used to them saying, thus saith the Lord. When you hear that phrase and you start thinking, okay, this is usually followed by a lie. If it's in the Bible and you hear Isaiah say, thus saith the Lord, and you're like, oh, he's going to lie next, that's a problem. Um, but yeah, 
So any other questions or comments about prophet's prophecy? We can move on to Timothy otherwise. Yeah, Thank you. yeah you're welcome. My, my pleasure. All righty. Let's see. Where are we time-wise first? Okay. We're good. We're good. Timothy. We're on 1 Timothy. And anytime you guys have any questions about any topics or anything like this, I'm more than happy to, to, to get into them. It's an excellent, excellent deviation as I dealt recently with. I have a friend. The prophecy bingo. Yes. If you've, if you've heard it or not, I was on a I was on a YouTube channel that does well, he does other he does other theology stuff too. He's a pastor, so to his credit, he does other things. But his main focus is dealing with people who claim to be prophets and are giving false prophecy. Um, so I got to, I got to play a little game with him called Prophecy Bingo, where we had a bingo card with all the words that they like to use. There's going to be a suddenly in your future in prosperity. I'm getting a download from the God from God that there will be a wealth transfer and uh, and a Shekinah. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's 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 ridiculous once you start realizing the pattern. They just kind of repeat the same phrases, snake oil salesman or whatever. It's organic. It's all natural. It's uh, I don't know what other phrases they use. Yeah, all new. It's on sale. Peachy keen. I don't know that I've seen that used in sales for a while, but yes. <laughs> all right, we are on I believe First Timothy chapter six. Let me just double check. Yes, we talked about the elders. We talked about so elders in this case meaning the pastors. The pastors should earn a paycheck, but then the pa- and doubly honored. At the same time, a pastor is held to a higher standard as other people. Um, <clears throat> then he tells uh, he tells Timothy to have a drink, uh, an alcoholic drink. He said, not only drink water, but a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. So the Bible, there are commands to drink alcohol. So anyone who says otherwise that alcohol is a sin has misunderstood a few verses in the Bible. This is just a command to Timothy. This isn't saying everybody who's got a, a, a tummy bug should be drinking wine all the time. But Timothy in particular, he's... Uh, he's he's saying you should take some wine wine with your water. Yeah. Well, the probably yeah. If you drink if you drink a, wix, a mixture of uh, wine and water on a regular basis, you can do it without getting drunk. Uh, but if you're just drinking wine, yeah. He says take a little wine with your water is what he's saying. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah, pickle them, pickle it. Yeah, pickle the uh, pickle the illness. All right, chapter six. <clears throat> Let all who are under a yoke as slaves regard their own masters as worthy of all honor. Okay, we're gonna have. We're going to have fun today. Master says, worthy of all honor, so that the name of God uh, God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on grounds that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit from their goods, from their good service are believers and beloved. Ooh, so the Bible says we can have slaves, right? Is that what it says? Have slaves. The Bible is uh, condoning slavery. Is that, is that what's going on here? Because there's a... It's saying slaves, uh, honor your masters. It's more complicated because we live in a complicated world and not all slavery is the same. So I don't even know where to start with this. First of all, we we are slaves. We are slaves to Christ. Doulos. The word word in the Bible, whenever you see the word in the New Testament that says servant, almost always translates to slave as well. We are slaves to Christ, slaves to righteousness. We are slaves to things like that. So being a slave isn't necessarily a bad thing in the sense that if your master is a perfect master, God. Well, so this is the other problem. So when you have the word slave slash servant, it doesn't necessarily mean chattel slavery. It could mean a housekeeper. It could mean somebody who's, I'll give you an example from um, how it sometimes but not always was in Hebrew culture. Um, You remember the, I don't know, Charles Dickens novels or whatever, they have like debtor's prisons and stuff like that where somebody's in debt and they throw them in prison for 100 years to pay the debt. And so in in the Old Testament, there was a there was a system set up basically that if you were impoverished, you were in debt, you owed money, and you just couldn't work your way out of the debt. What you could do is you could sell yourself and your family into slavery, which sounds really awful, but it was actually used as a social net. So it was saying, okay, I can't pay for things. You can pay for things. I will work at your house. You'll take care of me and my family because I cannot financially take care of my family. You will take care of my family, but I will work for you. And it was a social obligation where the, where the masters of the slaves had an obligation to treat their slaves right and to take care of their slaves, 
So their slaves you know, would, would be well-fed, would be educated, wouldn't starve. And in, in return, the slaves would work for the masters. And then every seven years, the debts would be reset. It's called the Jubilee year. The debts would be reset. The slaves would be released. Unless they chose to permanently, like, if you could be removed as a slave, you could actively choose. You could say, no, I love this person that I work for. I love this person that I serve as in whatever capacity. Uh, again, don't think chattel slavery like in the United States necessarily. It means any, tort, any sort of uh, obligated service, um, like, a, like the military, for example. You could actually, you could take an awl and pound a hole through your ear and basically say, I am permanently a member of this household. And there's, it's interesting in the Bible that there is examples of, um, it talks about uh, the difference between, in the New Testament, the difference between being a slave and a son. That the, that the difference is not in how you were treated, but the difference between a slave and a son is that the son has inheritance. So it says you are no longer slaves to Christ, but sons of God. So you're still connected to the family, but you're moved from the position of servitude to the position of inheritance. So in this... It's, it's, seven years you retire. Well, I don't know about retire. It's like a seven-year contract. I wouldn't say you wouldn't necessarily retire, but it's it's yeah, it's employment where you say, look, I can't take care of myself and my family. You're going to take care of me and my family, and I'm going to work hard for you because you're you're taking care of me, which is what a paycheck is. Yeah. So so when the Bible talks about slavery, it is often more complicated. It isn't always the case, however, that the slavery is a voluntary. Uh, is a voluntary arrangement. It isn't always the case. There are slaves that were captives. And if we're in the New Testament, like we are here in First Timothy, uh, a lot of times slaves were, there was a Greek concept of slave that was different. The Greek concept of slave is, is, is so confusing compared to today's idea of, of slavery. Slavery still exists today, by the way. We we're just Americans. We got rid of it because we're ahead of the times. It's a Christian, right? Yeah. No, um, uh, slavery does exist today in the sense that people are like active chattel slaves in other countries. That still exists. We got rid of it, you know, in the antebellum South and everything, but uh, we were ahead of the time or we're, you know, just being Christian more than other people were when we got rid of the evil form of slavery in the United States. But in the sense of the Greek form of slavery, it was often very different. You would have a slave who, for whatever reason, this person was just born a slave. Their family was a slave, etc. They're not released every seven years because they're not Hebrews. They're not under the Israelite covenant. Uh, and in some cases, the slaves were treated badly. In other cases, the slaves were treated so well that they would be better educated than the children. Imagine you've got like a family butler or something like that who's been with your family. Like he's seen your, like, if you want Batman, Alfred, right? The guy who's raised the children all the way up through adulthood and still continues to serve in the house and has a personal investment in the family's well-being. Uh, in such a case, you would often have um, the master of the house would say, okay, I've got all this work to do. I've got all these fi uh, financial work, finances to do. I am going to train a slave to be the most financially brilliant accountant ever. I'm going to make my slave into the accountant. And he's going to know numbers and he's going to write and read better than anybody else. And he's going to manage my money. And he gives him the checkbook. So it's not the sense of, you know, he's out in the field getting whipped. It's this guy works for me and he's connected to me and he represents my interests and he can go and negotiate deals on behalf of the master. Uh, and then in sense of, of education, a lot of times the sons, uh, you know, if you're a rich guy, you got sons that you just run around and, you know, you're like, okay, I wish my sons would behave better, but I'm rich and I don't have time to deal with them. Uh, I'm going to educate my slaves so that they can teach, they can be tutors for my, for my children. So a lot of times the slaves were literate and better educated than the kids, if for no other reason to, than to educate the children themselves. So when you have this verse here in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, where, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 through, 1 through 2, um, and it's talking about this. Let those who are under a yoke as slaves regard their own masters uh, as worthy of all honor. This covers a spectrum, a wide spectrum of what does it mean to be a slave? Everything from, okay, that's a voluntary thing, to you were born into slavery, to you're abused and it's chattel slavery. In all of these cases... When slavery is a job versus when slavery is, we think of slavery and a sin, in all of these cases, there is an obligation of the slave to be respectful of the person that God has placed in authority over them. All authority comes from God. Even the people who abuse authority, even bad kings, even Caesar himself, that authority comes from, remember Jesus is in the presence of, I don't remember if it's Herod or Pilate, 
And he says, I could have you killed or I could have you freed. And Jesus said, you have no authority if God had not given it to you. Which means that Jesus acknowledges that Herod had authority. Um, Even bad rulers, even slave masters have authority from God. They're abusing the authority. God will hold them accountable for that abuse of the authority. But there is a degree of obligation where the slaves have to say, okay, I will work hard. Just because my boss is evil doesn't mean that I will... I will be lazy as a worker. It sounds wild, especially as people who love freedom, but it's just a concept of do right even when everybody else is doing wrong to you. It's the right thing to do. A good example of that, Um, Pharaoh, like was it one of the sons of Abraham? Yes. You know, cast out by brother. Joseph, yeah, Joseph and his Technicolor dream coat, yeah. So Joseph was enslaved. He was sold into slavery. Joseph, so he had his 12 brothers. So 12 brothers said, let's kill him, except for Reuben said, let's not kill him. Let's leave him alive. They, threw, they put him in a pit, and then they said, hey, let's make some money off of him. So they sold him into slavery. He gets sold into slavery and goes to Potiphar's house. Now, he was unrighteously captured, unrighteously sold into slavery, and should not have been a slave. There was no legal reason why he should have been a slave, and it was not a good situation. It was not a voluntary service but he worked hard anyway. And he, so this is an excellent example of Joseph working hard in a situation that, that, you know, like let's say hypothetically there's a military draft and you're drafted. You, even if the government is terrible, there still is an obligation. That let's say you're in charge of counting boxes of bullets or whatever. There still is an obligation to do a good job. Like as a Christian, there's an obligation to to work hard, even if you're in an unjust situation. And Joseph's an excellent example of this because he was enslaved unrighteously and he worked as a righteous man under unrighteous men. And it's not a guarantee that every time that happens, you'll be you'll be the second in command over Egypt. That's not a guarantee that'll happen, but it is an obligation that Christians and believers had to uh, to work hard. Uh, Who was the guy? Jacob and Rachel and Leah. So he, was, he wants to marry Rachel. Jacob wants to marry Ra- Rachel. Uh, and Laban says, work for me for seven years, I think it is. And then you can marry Rachel. After seven years, he works for him. He gets married and oops, he married the wrong woman. He married Leah instead of H- Rachel. And Laban says, oh, don't worry. Work for me seven more years and I'll, I'll give you the right wife or whatever. Um, and in, these, in both cases, Jacob was being tricked by Laban, but he still worked hard, even though he knew that he was being taken advantage of. So being taken advantage of is not an excuse for us Christians to shirk our duties and to be lazy. It's a weird phrase, lazy slaves. Isn't that strange to think about? Like, if I'm enslaved, I have an obligation to work hard. I mean, obviously, if the the, the master is commanding you to sin, you don't do that. But in the sense of you're enslaved and the master commands you to change the diapers of his kids. Gross, but we do it to the best of your ability. And with love and care. Um, so this is, we Christians, we have a complicated responsibility. If you're under the yoke of slavery, uh, you honor your master. Do you want justice? Absolutely. Joseph should, is good to, to want to be freed from his master, but he did honor his master. He did manage his, he didn't try to sneak money out. He didn't try to, he didn't try to uh, bankrupt Potiphar or the Pharaoh. He, he did his best and he worked his hardest against under, under evil, unrighteous men, non-believers in a pagan nation where he was a slave, he worked as hard as he could, and it was noticed. It was specifically noted in the Bible that Joseph was a, that Joseph was a righteous and hard worker. Um, so yeah, anyways, that little verse uh, can get some Christians in trouble in the arguments on, uh, on the internet or wherever. Um, all right, uh, those who have believing masters must... Must not be, so, ver, so chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 2. Those who have, who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better. Since those who benefit, benefit by their good service uh, are believers and beloved. So again, the example of, of Joseph, Pharaoh was an unbeliever. But in the example of um, Phi, uh, the letters called Philemon. In the, in the, example, in the example of Onesimus, Um, In the letter of Philemon in the Bible, it's a short letter. It's a letter that Paul writes to a slave owner. He says to the slave owner, um, your slave has run away and come to me. The slave's name is Onesimus. Your slave has run away and come to me, and I am sending him back to you as your slave. 
uh, and you are both believers, and you should be treating each other as believers, and receive him back, not as a slave, but as a brother. So in one, in one sense, Paul is, Paul is saying, look, he is your slave, you are his master, you are both Christian, treat him right. To that end, don't treat him as a slave anymore, treat him as a brother. So Paul is simultaneously telling slaves and masters how to behave and advocating that slavery be done away with for the sake of a of, of, of family. So there's, again, if you're crawling out from under how many centuries that slavery is a thing, um, it's a difficult climb. You can't just say, okay, snap your fingers and we go from, um, we go from antebellum slavery in the United States to the Civil Rights Act overnight. There's a, there's, a, there's a gradation. There's, okay, people aren't going to follow this immediately, so treat each other right as you work towards this goal. Um, and again, the Bible gives us examples of even being slaves to Christ, moving from slavery to being sons of, sons of the Father, uh, whereas you were formerly slaves, you were now children, that sort of thing. So God's desire is the movement away from slavery, but God's acknowledgement is that slavery exists, so here's how you act as a slave, as a master, as somebody who lives in a country that has slaves, that sort of thing. All right, let's keep going unless there's more, more questions or comments. Um, teach and urge these things, verse 3 now, chap, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. Uh, he has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil, suspicions, suspicious, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. So this is, again, uh, it's interesting we talked about the false prophets this morning. This is, again, this idea of these people who preach to get, to get money. They preach specifically false things in order to cause controversy and to get power and money. Their desire is not to teach the truth. Their desire is to teach that which nets them the most profit. Prosperity preachers, we might call them. Exactly. Uh, okay, let's see. Verse 6. Now there is great gain. So this is interesting. So they're, they're trying to find after monetary gain. On the contrary, he says, Now there is great gain in godliness, with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For, oh, you pay attention to this verse and what I say. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Pay attention to what I didn't say. There was a person on Facebook sent me, um, sent me a meme. He thought he was so clever because I'd never heard this before. Ha ha. Sent me a meme. He says, if money is the root of all evil, why do churches ask for it all the time? It's so clever. Well, don't fall into his trap, though. This is true. But if money is the root of all evil, why do churches want it? Well, what Bible verse says that money is the root of all evil? What did I just read? Very carefully, what, the love of money is, what does it say exactly? If you could read that, please. The love of money is the, that's interesting, because that's not the same thing as money is evil. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It does not say that money is evil. Money is actually a blessing from God, just as property is. Wisdom, strength, everything that you have that can be used for good is a gift from God. It's exactly what that is. It's a form of idolatry. The love of money, the idolatry of money, and this can be used for anything, the idolatry of power, the idolatry of influence. The love of money is A, one of many roots of all kinds of evil. The love of money is one of the many ways that people have been tripped up. The love of money is A root of all kinds of evil which means there's a bunch of things that can screw people up. And obsession, idolatry of money is one of them. It's a, it's a particularly noteworthy one. It's not the only one, but it is not saying money itself is the root of all evil. <laughs> the love of money is a root 
of all kinds of evil, one of many, not of everything. Does the church really ask for money, though? Oh, absolutely. There is, yeah. God loves a cheerful giver. So this is a... Yes, it is. In the previous chapter, one of the things it talks about is paying the pastor. It, it, that is commanded in the Bible. Um, but another thing that it talks about is the church's obligation is to take care of each other. And this cannot be done if the church is not funded. Now, this means volunteers. This means service. This means love. This means prayer. But this also means money as well. If you love money, you don't want to get rid of it. But if you love God, you want to use that money to better help God. And you can do that by taking care of each other as Christians, individually, or as a church. Um, I, have, I don't think I've ever used this as a stewardship text. Um, stewardship, we have Stewardship Sunday or whatever. I think it's like once a year that I, that I tell you guys all that we need more money. Um, maybe we should do it every Sunday. Uh, there, is, there is a text in the Bible. You remember the widow's might? Have you heard of the story, the widow's might? What is the widow's might? Do you know? Like what, did she, what did she give? Like a penny? She gave all she had. It was a penny, but it was all she had. Uh, and in this story, you know, the, this rich man makes sure everybody sees him giving money. And this widow humbly comes up and gives her her last penny. And Jesus commends her. But the part of, the, the part of that story that I have jokingly threatened to preach on, but I've never done so, is... And Jesus were wa was watching all the people who were giving offering. I'm like, Jesus is watching you when you're using the offering plate. So be careful because he sees exactly how much you put in. That's not the point of the text. But it is interesting that Jesus is paying attention. It's not like, okay, nobody look while she gives money. He's like, hmm, look at how much money he's giving versus how much money she's giving. So Jesus, God does pay attention. He doesn't say, you don't need to give money. I'll give you miraculously take care of the church without money. But he is pointing out, he's saying, you know, he's saying that there's a difference between the attitude of the person who, who wants everybody to look, hey, everybody look as I'm giving money, and the person who says, I don't have much, but what I have is God's. So I haven't used that as a stewardship text, <laughs> or that, that part as a stewardship text, but it's always, it's always a, a, a joke that, you know, God's watching you when you give money. It's true, but it's, it's not how that text was intended to be used. Um, I got paid from you know, for a long time stewardship and how how are the things that have been given to the church being taken care of? That's what it's yeah, yeah. And it came to learn that, you know, in some cases in a lot of the Lutheran structures of the church throughout the nation, the financial committee and the financial folks are under stewardship. Yes. And so there was a lot of focus on the money is when our things were coming. And that that's very important. Mm -hmm. But it was also interesting. That at least in the in the place before the sanctuary, the North Bend, they kept little pamphlets, yeah, educational about the ways and means of taking care of your kids. If you picked up the one on stewardship, it did not talk about money. It talked about proper stewardship of the Word of God. Yes. Um, so that was something that began <coughs> to become discussed inside the stewardship. That's good. Yeah, and you can't have you can't have proper stewardship, a conversation about proper stewardship if you're excluding the word of God. The, the church is not, what is it, an LLC or whatever. A church is not a singular, uh, just a financial organization. Church is not a bank. The church's job is not to not to just physically invest. The church's job is to preach the word and administer the sacraments. That's where Luther says you'll find a tr true church wherever the, the word of God is rightly preached and the sacraments rightly administered. That's how you know that you're in a real church. Um, whatever else they have or don't have, if it's four sticks holding up a thatched roof and they have the word of God in sacraments, that is a true church, as true as any cathedral in Europe. Maybe more so sometimes. But in the case of stewardship, if the word of God is not the focus and the foundation, if the focus of the foundation is how do we become financially successful, solvent, whatever, as a church, we are not stewarding properly. Stewardship means to take care of what you have been given. That's what a steward is. Be a good steward of the things you've been given. And we've been given much more than money, things much more valuable than money. As, as this verse points out, that there are these, uh, there is great gain in godliness with contentment. So there are things that are much more valuable than money. Doesn't mean we should be negligent with money and just say, well, you know, George, why don't we take all the offering from the plate and go buy some scratchers, you know, some lottery scratchers instead. Why don't we go, why don't we just, just waste it on something silly? Um, 
we're not supposed to do that, obviously, but there's an obligation to, to, to word and sacrament ministry. There's also an obligation to be a good steward of everything that you have been given. And God has given you the Bible. God has given us the sacrament. God has also given us this building. And God has given us, you know, influence or responsibility or whatever it is. We need to be good stewards of all that we have. So, yeah, I like that idea of, of good stewardship, including and even having the foundation of the word and sacrament, but also including the finances and property and everything else that we have. Uh, how are we doing for time? We are at time. All right, I'm going to try to remember. If I don't remember, well, next week will I be here? Not the higher things, huh? I won't be here next week. That's right. All right, so when I come back, let's do 1 Timothy chapter, excuse me, chapter 6, verse 11 through following. 